rally and stocks took a breather today. The TSX retreating from yesterday's record closing level. And of course, in the US market, we've seen record after record broken, especially by the S&P 500 lately. We're joined now by a guest who says the TSX still trades at a very steep valuation discount to the S&P 500, and there may well be room left to run for Canadian stocks. We're joined by Brian Madden, Chief Investment Officer at First Avenue Investment Council. It's great to see you. Thank you, Andrew. Good to see you as well. You're looking back at some historical patterns and precedents. And what do you say when it comes to the TSX? I mean, is the TSX cheap right now, Brian? Uh, yeah, in the absolute, it's reasonably priced, not mm -hmm. um, barn burner cheap okay. uh, by historical standards, but the valuation disparity relative to uh, its American counterpart, the S&P 500, uh, is approaching some of the historically widest levels we've seen, uh, with the TSX trading at about 15 times expected profits and the S&P 500 at a, a multiple closer to 21 and a half. So that gap of about six and a half multiple points is uh, large in the absolute. It's 30% close to, uh, and it's uh, historically wide as well. You have to go back almost to the turn of the century um, to find a valuation gap between the two markets this wide. So uh, if the, the S&P was to drop back to the TSX valuation, that would be a correction of about 25%. Uh, yeah, close to, or, or a little bit uh, more than that, in fact. So yeah, that would be a sharp pullback for the S&P 500. And to be clear, you know, that's not uh, the base case. Valuation disparities uh, in a stock or in a market relative to another one can persist for a very long time. Um, but, you know, historically, these are markets that are fairly correlated, not surprisingly. So our expectation would be that the convergence occurs in the good way, okay. uh, which is to say, uh, the TSX plays catch up to the S&P 500, which, as you noted uh, off the top, has been setting record high after record high. And the TSX is late to the party, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, you know, just setting its first uh, closing record in almost two years yesterday. What could get the two? What could uh, inflate the multiple on Toronto stocks, do you think? Well, one of the things that's very interesting uh, is a bit of a self-help story, uh, truth be told, Andrew. We're seeing historically very high levels of shareholder activism mm. in Canada. Um, you know, and that's hardly surprising when you see companies um, that are high quality issuers that are just sort of being neglected or passed over as everyone locks on to the next shiny thing, which mm -hmm. um, you know, for the last year and a half has been big mega cap US technology. But we've got um, active and ongoing shareholder activism campaigns and some big uh, well-known and well-established TSX companies like Gildan Activewear, notably um, got put in play mm -hmm. earlier this week. Parkland Corporation, um, Engine Capital has been agitating for change there for quite some time. Uh, GFL Environmental would be another one, Melcor Real Estate Investment Trust, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, shareholder activism, uh, you know, is not a new thing. Uh, we've got a, a nice, warm and fuzzy name for it now. But when the likes of Carl Icahn mm -hmm. uh, started these tactics in the late 80s, uh, they were sort of thought of as thugs or brawlers, and they called them corporate raiders. But mm -hmm. in our view, Shareholder activism uh, is a feature and not a bug of our uh, shareholder capitalism or, or shareholder environment here in Canada and the United States for that matter, where Disney, for instance, would be a, a good high profile uh, American example where an activist is trying to agitate for change and uh, value creation, value surfacing. Um, Nelson Pelse making noise at uh, Disney. Correct. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then Algonquin now, we've got uh, a dissatisfied investor. Yeah, actually, I meant to mention that one, yeah. but that's yet another one that has popped on the radar here. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this is good. The boards of directors and the management teams of companies are supposed to be uh, working hard round the clock every day on behalf mm -hmm. of the shareholders they represent to, um, to generate value. Uh, you know, either operationally or financially, but um, you know, when they fall short of the task, um, there's quite a veritable army of activist funds out there that are willing to take up the torch on behalf of other shareholders who all bene benefit uh, by piggybacking on their coattails. Has there been a complacency in Canada where boards have been uh, let away with um, slack performance? You know, there are some, and we've seen successful activist campaigns. Uh, you know, one that comes to mind would be 
uh, RB Global last year, where they underwent um, quite a metamorphosis led by, you know, at the outset, uh, a very controversial uh, acquisition of a U.S. company. Mm -hmm. Uh, and eventually activists got involved to and fro. The CEO left amidst uh, a hailstorm of uh, legal hoopla. But um, at the end of the day, um, you know, it did uh, right the ship and the stock has performed quite admirably since then. Tech Resources would be another one that had uh, activists all over it uh, amidst uh, agitation yeah. for change in strategy, divesting coal assets, and so on and so forth. So, you know, these things can work, and we have uh, a number of examples where they have. So, the environment is ripe mm -hmm. for it, where you have uh, undervalued, overlooked companies, and uh, uh, and a good governments governance environment um, where um, you know you can sow the seeds and then let shareholders um, you know decide what they think is the best course of action. It's just the activists bring to light alternative courses of strategy mm -hmm. uh, that may not be um, top of the list for the incumbent management and board. Yeah, any I guess any organization group think is a, is a hazard, and a fresh uh, perspective is valuable sometimes. Well, that's right, that's right. And sometimes in a boardroom, it can get clubby, and there are friendlies, yeah. and uh, you know that's not supposed to be the case. So mm -hmm. There are skills matrices that boards fill out, and. Um, you know, the best practice in governance is to have a majority independent board, but mm -hmm. sometimes shareholders are left to wonder how independent is this mm -hmm. board really? How beholden are they to, um, you know, the management and um, how, uh, <clears throat> how cozy are they and how uh, addicted are they to getting those director's fees? So, and uh, options and, and yeah. options and the like. So yeah. uh, it's good to have some sharp elbowed activists in the room from time to time when that environment does set in uh, and a board becomes static or complacent, uh, which, which can become the case. Brian, thank